to day three. So glad to see you all fresh on a Friday morning. I One of the things that struck me about our conference is this idea of hope that's been strung through many of our conversations. And to me, hope is not a, a simple act. Uh, it's not one that ignores suffering, but that does look into possibility spaces in, in new ways. And that often involves a, a critical look at systems as well. And I was reminded this morning of a, something that the Bulgarian writer Maria uh, Popova put nicely recently. Critical thinking without hope is cynicism, but hope without critical thinking is naivety. And I really liked that. And I think the other thing that's been coming out is this, you know, it's the sense of optimism. And I think that that's somehow intrinsic to the work that we do. And I'm happy to, to see it here as a way to make futures more accessible and to really unleash the imagination. Joy has been another theme that's strung through. And I was very, very excited to be able to wish Tanya Herchert, happy birthday today. But she's not here right now. And so your challenge is to find her today and to wish her happy birthday uh, because she is such an embodiment of, of joy and has made such a profound contribution to this work around strategic foresight. So please find her and uh, thank her for being such a good human. Uh, I'm really pleased to welcome Laura Forlano here to us this morning. Uh, Laura is a science and technology studies scholar and a design researcher and an associate professor at the Institute of Design at the Illinois Institute for Technology, where she also directs the Critical Futures Laboratory. Laura has worked with many of us at ASU over the years projects with the Center for Science and the Imagination, uh, work with the Center for Nanotechnology and Society, and we are always excited to welcome Laura into the mix for her special take on thinking about the, the politics and aesthetics of emerging technologies and kind of interweaving her critical analysis with concern around social values and care. She's also done an extraordinary job over the years uh, engaging a wide variety of diverse audiences in her work. So i um, very excited to welcome Laura to the conference and to also invite you to check out some of her recent books. She came out with one called Bauhaus Futures uh, and another around digital digital STS. And uh, these are, I think, really important for us who are trying to think about emergent futures. Laura. Okay, thank you so much, Cynthia. It's great to be here in person at ASU, um, a place that um, I've come to know, you know, better and better over the years. Um, and this morning, I'm gonna talk about uh, CRIP Futurity, cyborg disability and designing the world otherwise. So I go by she, her pronouns. I identify as white, middle-class, highly educated, living with a disability, privileged, Italian-American. I think I'm human, but I also write from the perspective of the disabled cyborg. And the topic of the future has come up in so many of my field sites and also generative design work. Um, so connecting the future, making the future here, the future today, but I'm really interested in the intersection of critical theories from the social sciences and humanities and what that means when you bring it into conversation with generative practices in design and futuring. So today, um, talking to you a little bit um, from a new project, um, and a new piece of writing that is coming out in Interactions Magazine in January. So as a disabled cyborg, I'm not supposed to have a future, but today I want to invite you to imagine a future in which everyone is disabled. And that's exactly what 
this very new book I just received in the mail the other day is, is arguing. Um, and I want to argue that all disabled people are design futurists because our experience, our existence depends on it. Okay. So now I'm going to sort of segue into a piece of uh, creative nonfiction writing. Auto mode disabled by user read the medical chart. The smart system had been turned off from midnight to noon the following day, an act of disobedience by the user, me, in order to get a few hours of sleep. This is not a research project that I chose, but rather one that landed on me in 2011 when I learned that I was type one diabetic. For four years from 2018 to 2022, I used one of the first world's first automated systems for delivering insulin in order to manage and control my blood sugar. So I identify research and write as a disabled cyborg, but I'm cyborg not because my body is partly made up by machines, the insulin pump and sensor system, but because of my interest in cyborg knowledges, practices, and politics that take disability into account in order to question the myth of technological perfection and solutionism, while at the same time seeking out possibilities for more generative questioning and engagement. So I am not a problem to be solved. For me, the notion of cyborg disability acknowledges that both humans and machines might be understood as imperfect, unsolvable, and yes, even disabled. And it, perhaps it's not so unusual to talk about computational technologies as disabled. As this example illustrates, it's a common colloquial and technical expression when talking about computing. For example, your, your account has been disabled. But we rarely understand disability to be a property of both humans and machines. Rume Williams and her co-authors write that CRIP HCI recognizes the researcher as situated and thus articulated uh, within the socio-technical meta context of society, scholarship, research, and design inquiry and practice. Here, disability can be understood as a means of rupture, disturbing existing knowledge practices and disciplinary norms. Disabled scholars committed to a CRIP understanding of disability argue that it's not a lack of something, a normative body or an accessible society, but rather an expansion of what it means to be human, unmaking and remaking existing ideas about humanity while at the same time opening up generative possibilities for intervention, action, and change. So in this piece, I use autoethnographic field notes on my own experience of disability as a type one diabetic, which includes my use of a synthetically produced hormone, insulin, a machine, my insulin pump, an assortment of a, a arrangement of digital and analog parts, including sensors, tubing, charging cables, alcohol swabs, insertion devices, needles, and the like. I use my own observations from day-to-day -day life with machines in order to better understand the ethical and political stakes of computing and design. In fact, I believe it's my responsibility as a researcher to pay careful attention to these experiences and the ways um, that disabled people have long been exper experimental subjects um, for technologies that are later deployed in the general population. The fragile arrangement of human, machine, biotechnological and analog things makes life possible and also sometimes quite impossible. With technologies offering new affordances and modes of living, they also introduce complexities that require attention, care, and maintenance. Software updates, regulatory changes, and medical innovations offer new possibilities, but they also remove some ways of being in the world. Habits, routines, practices, and even notions of selfhood and subjectivity are reshaped around seemingly small modifications. Often, I'm not sure whether I'm taking care of these devices or whether they are taking care of me. A turn towards a more relational, more than human and or post-human subjectivity that sees humans and machines as intimately entangled rather than as discrete entities that ha as they have been traditionally conceived. My field notes are foggy, patchy, and partial often fragmented statements sent by email to myself in the middle of the night before dozing back to sleep. For me, intimacy as method 
engages affective dimensions, in this case, fatigue, exhaustion, and burnout. By the glow of the iPhone, they hint at possible vignettes that can be copied into a Scribner file and brought to life the following day when the sun is shining through the heavy red curtains in the living room. But while personal in nature, they are not meant to be confessional. As an author and researcher, I can decide what details to share and which to hide. My purpose is not to illuminate my own life per se, but what rather what it means to live with machines when your life truly hangs in the balance. So part one, plans and situated algorithmic actions. In 2003, before I adopted an insulin pump and sensor system, I often woke in the night, drenched in sweat and nearly too weak to get out of bed to get a 15 ounce glass of orange juice from the refrigerator in the kitchen a few steps away, or even to reach for chalky glucose tablets sitting on the nightstand. I often went to sleep hoping that I would wake up in the morning and not fall into a diabetic coma. When teaching my classes, my face would go numb. While walking down the street, I'd suddenly not be able to feel my legs. While the fear of frequent severe lows is a thing of the past in my case, from 2018 to 2022, due to the need to calibrate the sensor system in order to ensure the continued operation and accuracy of the insulin pump, I was not able to sleep through the night more than a few times a week. It's almost ironic that the system that has nearly eliminated the frequent episodes of extreme low blood sugar that woke me in the middle of the night almost a decade ago has enforced another form of sleep interruption and deprivation. But this one feeds data to the algorithm rather than sugar to the body. With this smart system, frequent sleep interruption was such a common occurrence that I was convinced that I was sleeping like a sensor in shorter patterns that mimic the, sense, the system. And in short, if you cannot sleep, you cannot dream. With long-term sleep deprivation leading to anxiety, irritability, and depression, I believe that the AI system that was keeping me alive was also ruining my life. Part two, 2021. A disabled cyborg is nothing without the right parts. So one morning in early December, on the final day of the semester, I got a low battery alert. It was 11.45 a.m., and I needed to eat lunch before heading to campus to teach that afternoon at 2 p.m. I unscrewed the battery cap with a coin, a quarter to be exact. I popped the new battery in and screwed the battery cap back on. But the pump did not recognize the battery, and the screen did not illuminate. I glanced at the small table in the corner of the room where I'd placed the pump, and I saw a small copper-colored piece of metal that the shape of a plus sign with little grooves and bumps. The piece had fallen off the cap. My heart was pounding. I was very stressed and afraid in an existential kind of way. I called the company's tech support, but the soonest they could deliver a new battery cap was the following day. I considered the possible fixes for the broken cap. I went to buy some super glue at the nearest CVS pharmacy located within a Target store. I sat on a bench in the pharmacy, carefully dropping a, a dab of glue onto the battery cap and trying to fix the metal piece. Once it dried, I screwed it back on, but still this made no difference. My phone rang and it was the local diabetes educator. He'd remembered my name from the original training three years before. He had a few extra battery caps and could drop one off that afternoon. At 2.45 p.m., he met me at the pharmacy. I bought a package of new batteries and inserted them into the pump along with the new battery cap. Ta-da, the screen illuminated. I reconnected my pump uh, to my body. In seven years, this was the longest that I had been disconnected from my pump. My heart started beating more slowly. I zipped up my coat and headed over to a restaurant for lunch. As I was walking westward away from the pharmacy, I felt a familiar buzzing under my coat. Bzz, 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 bzz. The sensation that had been such a nuisance for so many years reminded me that once again, I was still alive. Bzz, 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 bzz. I was reunited with my disabled cyborg identity. I unzipped my coat from the bottom and took out my pump. Calibrate now, the alert said. Calibrate now. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, part three, 2022, the machine that brought me to my knees. It was 3.30 a.m. on a Saturday morning in late August after a long, intense week of travel. I was in the bathroom, grasping the porcelain of a toilet bowl, hanging on as if my life depended on it. And in fact, it did. 
I'd awoken with dangerously high blood sugar. I thought it was strange. I hadn't eaten much the day before because I was worried I would run out of insulin before getting back home to New York. About 30 minutes before I got home on a delayed A train, my pump started its characteristic buzzing and beeping. It's only means of communicating with me. It's human being. As soon as I arrived sweaty and tired, I changed the cartridge of insulin in the pump and tubing that was attached to my stomach. Facing a refrigerator that was nearly empty after four weeks of travel, I went straight to bed without dinner, too tired to make any additional effort. At 4 a.m., I drank some water, ate some crackers, and went to, back to bed, administering insulin with the pump every 30 minutes and monitoring its effect on my BG, blood glucose. I felt nauseous again and ran to the bathroom. At 5 a.m., I hypothesized that I wasn't getting any insulin at all, so I changed the tubing. At 7.30 a.m., there was still no change, and my husband went for a haircut. At 8.15, I texted him. The numbers were finally coming down. I fell fast asleep at 9 a.m. Later that day, I removed the original site. Sure enough, the small tube that delivered the insulin had bent and slid right under the adhesive tape and never entered my skin. The humidity in the apartment had prevented the adhesive from sticking properly, and I'd been in without insulin for nearly 12 hours for the first time in 10 years. It took me a week to recover. So in considering both my technologies at, as well as myself as disabled, I see failure rather than perfection as the default setting. As a disabled cyborg, I'm aware that the social and technological systems fail together. There may not be a single place to put the blame. But at the same time, like my CRIP identity, failure is not a lack, but what it means to live with disability and what it means to live with machines. So here I move to some more generative questions as this project moves from kind of a more of a critical sense making um, of this living with machines to some generative interventions. Um, and here are some of the what if questions that I ask about you know, what if I design new fashions? Uh, and what if I use my data to create objects? I'm gonna show you two examples. Um, so this is a bathing suit. Um, in 2015, my worries about going to the beach um, as a disabled cyborg led me to reach out to Sky Cubba Cub of Rebirth Garments, a fashion designer that creates queer crip garments with disabled people. Um, and I made a custom made bathing suit uh, to accommodate the insulin pump. And this really allowed me to think more about the invisibility of diabetes as a disease in tandem with the visibility of the machine that I use to control my blood sugar. And then more recently, um, currently, uh, since 2020, uh, 2020, a very pandemic-born project, I've begun collaborating with interdisciplinary visual artist Itziar Badio on a series of robotic sculptures that use data from my first smart insulin pump, the one that kept me awake at night for much of uh, 2018 to 2022. Um, and when I visited Barrio's studio in December 2020, I was struck by the ways in which the choice of materials, the cement, spandex, and rubber suggested an alternative narrative about computing in contrast to the shiny metal and glass of the, of the latest line of mobile phones. Um, and I could really visualize in the room the scholarly citations that might support such a line of questioning. Um, and the data that's being used in this sculpture um, is coming from the summer of 2019, uh, when I spent the month of July transcribing the alert and alarm data on a daily basis in order to understand the patterns. And here's one example from a day when I received over one alarm per hour. 12.31 a.m low reservoir, 5.56 a.m., calibrate now, 7.01 a.m., calibrate now, 8.06 a.m., calibrate now, 8.31 a.m., change sensor, 1.05 p.m., low reservoir, 2.27 p.m., low sensor signal, 2.43 p.m., possible signal interference, 2.59 p.m., check connection, ensure transmitter and sensor connection is secure, then select OK. 5.02 p.m., sensor connected. 5.06 p.m., sensor warm-up. 7.01 p.m., calibrate now. 7.30 p.m., BG required. 7.31 p.m., alert on low. 7, I'm sorry, uh, 8.11 p.m., alert on low. 8.41 p.m., alert on low. 
8.46 p.m., low SG, sensor glucose. 9.06 p.m., alert on low. 9.06 p.m., low SG. 9.31 p.m., alert on low. 9.40 p.m., BG required. 9.40 p.m., calibration not accepted. 9.56 p.m., calibrate now. 9.58 p.m., change sensor. So with the sculptures, um, they make very subtle movements. Um, and in one of them, you can see that some of the data is actually printed directly on the circuit board um, that's powering the sculpture. And this is a reminder of the human labor that's required to make automated systems work. Um, and these uh, sculptures translate the data into subtle, the subtle movements recall the writhing movements for four years of sleep deprivation and also small balloons that inflate and deflate, mimicking inhaling and exhaling of human lungs. Um, and just to be clear, um, it's your sculptures were already in progress when we met. And so this is sort of my interpretation and how I rethink myself through the sculptures and through my experience. Um, so to conclude, um, AI, like all technological systems, is disabled, but our design processes are still overwhelmingly skewed towards optimization, um, perfection, efficiency, success, and the happy path. We vastly underestimate and minimize the ways in which they might fail and the way that things might go wrong, leaving others to suffer the consequences of our actions. While making things work is difficult, it's even more difficult to acknowledge that things might not go as planned. Um, so here I wanna to move to a number, just highlight a couple of projects that are rethinking computation and rethinking AI systems. Um, and so while disabled scholars offer modes of rupturing disciplinary no, mo norms and accounting for diverse experiences with computational systems, Artists through creative practice um, are challenging common terminologies, terminologies around computing. So a couple of these projects, and I, I won't go into detail, but um, just to, to highlight, um, Maya Indira Ganesh uh, AI is for another, a kind of online um, archive of, of metaphors around AI. Um, Heather Dewey Haborg Stranger Visions, um, using DNA and making uh, these faces based on that. Um, um, Stephanie Dinkins' uh, Secret Garden, um, which reimagines, um, just want to quickly, uh, which argues that stories are algorithms with an immersive uh, installation that, that showcases Black women's stories. Um, Netrice Gaskins uh, with her uh, notions of techno vernacular creativity in these algorithmically generated portraits of well-known black leaders, um, exploring the ways in which culture and making by diverse groups can expand knowledge practices. And um, uh, Mimi Onuhas and Mother Cyborg's People's Guide to AI and Mika Cardenas's um, public performances as poetics, which are understood as actions, movements, ritual offerings, and possibilities of life for trans of color artists. Um, so here, I just wanted to reference a couple of um, ideas from uh, Crip Justice and Crip Techno Science. So Amy Hamrai and Kelly Frisch write in the Crip Techno Science Manifesto uh, that Crip Techno Science uh, centers the work of disabled people as knowers and makers, is committed to access as friction, including protest and non-compliance. Um, it is committed to interdependence as a political technology and committed to disability justice and here, um, Sins Anvalid, uh, the activist group, uh, has 10 principles of disability justice, um, which they uh, list as intersectionality, leadership of the most impacted, anti-capitalist politic, commitment to cross-movement organizing, recognizing wholeness, sustainability, commitment to cross-disability solidarity, interdependence, collective access, and collective liberation. Um, and about a year ago, Ford Foundation launched the first ever disability rights program and some associated artworks uh, and exhibitions. Um, and here's an image from Sinzamba Leeds, a disability justice from A to Z coloring book in which they give us a new vocabulary to talk about disability and then bring that to life through these um, wonderful images. Um, and Leonardo's uh, Cryptech Incubator has 
supported um, disabled artists to create better ways of accessing museums um, and making museums more um, you know, inclusive. Um, and here, uh, this statement from a platform called Future Architecture by Joel Stein, um, talking a little bit about the ways in which our imagining of near future worlds should go beyond accommodation and inclusion um, and to one that's actively shaped by the desires, needs, and radical possibilities of disabled peoples towards practices of speculative care um, and caring spaces. Um, and by placing power in the lived experiences of disabled communities, we can confront systems of power that are bound up with questions of care and care taking. Um, so with that, I'm gonna close the presentation. I look forward to your questions. Um, and I can also share some brand new field notes with you if you're interested, um, but thank you very much again. Thank you very much, Laura, for that really uh, inspired and intriguing and uh, generative presentation. Uh, we do have time for some questions, curiosities, things that resonated with you. Thank you, Laura, for the interesting presentation. I wonder about this concept of failure and how you compare design for efficiency, optimization, and what, how should we advise designers uh, in, in their practice? To embrace failure or to consider how users or consumers or people can manage failure? How, how we can design better considering failure? Yeah, I think there are a number of, I mean, it's been a theme, of course, I think in STS research for a, you know, for a long, long time, thinking about infrastructures and systems and Lee, Susan Lee Starr's work on infrastructure that becomes visible upon breakdown, right? Um, and I think there are multiple ways. Of course, there's the line of reasoning about iteration and failure, that iteration really is about testing things out. Um, but I think it's also about the social consequences of technology. And I think recent papers that I've seen, which are really interesting, talking about um, algorithmic failure and sort of missing data sets and like really using the ways in which technologies are imperfect for generative exploration of new systems to better understand them. Um, so I, I think there's multiple uh, ways to think about that. And maybe those are just the three that come to mind. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Morning, Rob. Hi, thank you, uh, Kai Rivers. My name. Um, I thought it was a really interesting talk. Thank you. I, I really enjoyed the autoethnography method, which um, it really kind of opened up the material. And uh, as a designer, it, it gave me a kind of insight into that into that world. So I'm just uh, in, I'm really interested to hear what that's like for you to kind of expose yourself in a rather intimate way, if you will, and how you think that method is potentially scalable or um, Mm -hmm. replicable thank you yeah so i it's been very interesting i would say uh in around 2014 when i started thinking about writing about this work um or this existence <laughs> um it was really because of humorous everyday situations that happened that i just thought were kind of hilarious so i kept getting stuck on the knobs of the kitchen counter <laughs> because the tubing when i would be standing too close and I would reach around to get a cup of coffee and I would be like, whoops, I can't really go over there. So I just thought this was really funny. And, and you know, all of this research about entanglement and here I am like entangled with the counter. <laughs> so I did it literally just to amuse myself and because I thought it was interesting and because all of the same questions that I'd asked about wireless infrastructures or smart cities or other topics were pretty much, you know, very similar kinds of themes, um, but just with a very different field site. And so I published my first article and I was very concerned about it because not many people, I hadn't told that many people I was diabetic and I didn't have a network of others um, as well. But I did find that the work 
got a good response and that people were interested. Um, and for me, I think one of the aspects that we can link to kind of future making is the ways in which this project has allowed me to tr change also my way of presenting. So when I'm inhabiting the role of the disabled cyborg and presenting from that voice and writing from that voice, I'm able to give more performative presentations as well. So it's, it's a difference from, you know, like I'm an academic and I can tell you all the theories and all the ideas. So it's been really exciting to move in that direction because I find it a really powerful mode of storytelling. Um, and I have in, in my classes on critical context at scale, we do do a, an autoethnographic exercise. And so students spend a week just documenting their everyday life. And they've come up with some incredible videos just about like their shoes, navigating the city of Chicago, or just taking new perspectives on things and also finding out what's meaningful to them. So I think it's a great, starting point about what is data, you know, how does data get created, um, and, you know, how, how can people also feel more invested in the work that they're doing because they've, you know, taken the time to look at their own life. So I think it can be used in that way, and I was really inspired yesterday by the presentation by, is it Nicole, um, who talked about the autoethnographic or, or the individual sort of scale and how one can maybe mobilize you know, agencies and um, new capacities for people to reflect on their own lives. Um, so yeah, I think there's a lot of potential and I have been trying to get there, but I think literally from the period of 2018 to 2022, early 2022, I was really so stuck in that experience with that previous device that it made it really hard to be as generative with the project. And now I'm seeing a lot more, you know, especially with the collaboration with ITZYAR, which we're making a third sculpture that's um, gonna be opening at a gallery in New York in the spring. Um, and also having plans to do a data physicalization project with one of my colleagues at ID, Zach Pino. Um, and, you know, just having those discussions, I can move it into a more generative space and see, you know, what what can be done with it. But it's been a really interesting process for sure. Hi, um, thank you so much. Um, my sister, my younger sister is a type one diabetic. So when you were talking about getting stuck on the kitchen bench, I remember her, she always gets stuck on door handles and things like that. Um, but I was wondering if you've brought this work to other diabetics and what they think about it or yeah, what, what that community thinks or what you would think about doing this with, with others as well that are not kind of from an academic background. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, oh, and I, I want to make one other point about the autoethnographic, which is I really like um, Monica Huerta's book, and her argument is that this is, you know, autoethnographic research is not necessarily confessional. So I really see it as, you know, a research project like any other. You have to take, you know, you have to take field notes and write up the stories and, and think about the moments and, um, and that it's not necessarily about you, actually. It's about, like, what it means to be human and how we live with these devices. Um, but yes, you know, for 10 years, I really had not met that many other people. And it's only been fairly recently that now I think I have a list of about 15 um, type one or type two diabetics who um, I've met mostly on Twitter uh, or, and or at design conferences. And now we are just beginning, you know, potentially to create some kind of network of these folks and think about, you know, for example, qualitative ways of understanding the data or, you know, there's lots of possibilities when you have a, you know, a little bit of a critical mass, um, but I hadn't really found those people. And then, you know, there's I, type one diabetics on Twitter are some of the funniest people ever. So um, that, you know, I just follow lots of people and I've been to some events, uh, both like the insulin for all kind of activist um, meetings, and then also something by the world, world health organization. So I would say that part of the project has just been very slower to develop, um, but yeah, there's a lot of possibility for sure. Great, thank you. I have a question about um, the idea of crip futurity and what that means to you. And 
as you've been here this week and listening to the variety of conversations that are happening around this uh, field of anticip anticipation studies, wonder if you could just elaborate further on crypt futurity and how you see that contributing to some of the work and practices. Yeah, I mean, definitely this idea that everyone in the future will be disabled is a pretty big um, concept to get your head around, sort of a crip identity as a positive affirmative thing versus as a lack of something. I mean, we're still, it's still very difficult to talk about disability in everyday situations or with employers or with friends or partners. Like people stigmatize even discussing of it. So we're, we're really like far from uh, even being able to relate to one another. And, and the fact that, that disability is such a um, diverse category, obviously, there are just so many different kinds of disabilities. And so, uh, you know, just spending time trying to understand what that a day in the life is, and maybe not empathy, but, you know, literally just trying to get our heads around this, right? So that's that. But then I do think, you know, the artworks, the, the activism, the statements, there, I, I would definitely resonate with the previous um, keynote talks that, you know, there's, in a way, there is not a lack of imagination. There's tons of examples of what kinds of worlds people are seeking, um, which we can find in, in activist campaigns and in, in the artworks and imagery and, and just the fact that people continue to survive. Because again, as I said at the beginning, disabled people are not um, supposed to have a future. And Alison Kafer makes this point really well in her book, um, Feminist Queer Crip, which is just like every interaction with your, you know, health providers and are, are literally essentially trying to deny your existence. And when you look carefully into the fact that disabled people know that when they go to the hospital, they should put on some kind of ring onto one of their hands, one of their fingers, because otherwise uh, they won't get very good treatment. So if someone else cares about them and they have that signifier of a ring, they get better treatment at the hospital or the ways in which, um, you know, uh, social services give, uh, you know, essentially financial support. Uh, disabled people are over, over a certain amount, like you're not, you can't be married to get a certain amount of, of government aid. I mean, that's like really sick. <laughs> but uh, so I, I think, I think my argument is that the, the, the worlds are already here, very evident in these lives, but we just don't know enough about the, the diversity of what it means to be human through disability. And so that's one of the big arguments. Thank you, Laura, very much for your talk this morning. And we have our gift from all of us to all of you. And if we get a one more round of applause for Laura. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so much. It's great to be here.